Almighty God, we thank you that you did not stay far off from us, but drew near to us to give us the bread of life, the true bread from heaven that fills us and enlivens us and gives us hope and purpose, empowers us to grow up into the full stature of Christ. And yet, Father, we know how quickly wayward our souls are, our eyes wander, we long for all of the treasures of the earth, and we recognize that they are an offering far too small in comparison to the way that you have loved us and cared for us and remained faithful to us, even in the midst of all of our moments of unfaithfulness. Lord, without your spirit, we can do nothing that pleases you, so fill us with your spirit today, Lord. Be in the hearts of all who hear, both in this room and online, um, be in every word that I say, um, that we might glorify you, that we might find ourselves more and more dependent upon you as our only rock and our only redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. To begin this morning, I want you to imagine what it would be like if Jesus came and visited us this morning at Christ Church in his resurrected body. That he walked through the narthex doors this morning live and in technicolor. He would be warmly greeted by Adele. I'm sure she'd be slack-jawed. And she'd be handed a service leaflet by a dumbfounded usher. Uh, but in my imagination, he doesn't come in and sit down, because you better believe I'm not preaching on the day that Jesus comes to visit us. Instead, I imagine him walking around and spending some time with each and every one of you. Imagine if he sat in your pew with you and met with you heart to heart. Imagine the creator God of the universe in the flesh, the one who knows you, root and bone, the one who is intimately aware of your every spiritual gift and your every hidden sin. Some of you might want to crawl under your pew, right? Um, knowing how much Jesus knows about us. But today he would be here out of love for you. And we would just sit there and let him meet with every one of us as long as he wanted to stay. I don't imagine that any of you would be looking at your watches wondering when lunch was coming. I wonder what you think he would have to say to you. Imagine with me further that after that time of fellowshipping with each and every one of you, he ended his time with us by doing mighty acts of healing in our midst. He restored sight and knit together failing hearts and strengthened limbs and restored marriages and drove out of our lives the sins that possess us. And then he just left. He goes out that epistle transept door and ascends back to the right hand of the Father, doing his loving work of interceding for you and for me, while his spirit remains with us, doing that sanctifying work in each of our hearts. Well, that would just be awesome, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't our lives never be the same? You'd call all your friends this afternoon, wouldn't you? You'd call the papers. You would be, have your faith unbelievably rekindled. I'd like to think that our lives would never be the same. Or would they? Because here is a question for us to ponder. How long would that feeling of euphoria last? Scripture teaches us that our human hearts have very short memories for the good work of God. In a few days, I fear we would have new creaks and groans in our never-failing bodies. We'd wonder where God was to heal us all over again. We'd find new things about which to complain. We'd entertain new sins. We'd find new things about which to be prideful or selfish or angry. The old Adam is very strong, and we would soon be grumbling about how Jesus wasn't making regular visits to Christ church that we could plan for, so that we'd make sure we didn't miss church on that day. 
Does this thought experiment seem ridiculous to you? Some of us probably think that if God made a real appearance to us, then all human doubt and disobedience would be a thing of the past. In my efforts to witness to unbelievers, often they'll say, I just wish that God would show up on the clouds, reveal himself to be the God of Jesus and the resurrection coming again soon. No one would have any doubts about God anymore. Well, that's not what Scripture tells us. The witness of Scripture is that God reveals Himself to us over and over again, and human beings turn to Him in thanks, but our attention spans are very, very short. But I want you to trust me this morning, because this sermon is about hope. For God knows us. He knows you. He knows me, root and branch. And he knows that we need to be continually refreshed in our experience of his power and his grace. I hope that we'll be encouraged by what God's word says today because here is what it teaches. We are quick to forget the power of God. But God is quick to forgive us for the times our faith in him fails. And that he feeds us every day with the bread of life. Every day he reveals himself to us. If we will just keep our eyes open so that we might live as those who find our hope, not in the things of this world, but in him. Let's begin this morning in today's lesson from Exodus. Surely no community of human beings that has ever walked the planet were more exposed to the mighty works of God than were the Hebrew slaves of Egypt. Through plagues and signs and wonders and good grief, a parted Red Sea, he brought them out of slavery with his mighty hand. What more did they need to see and experience to believe forever in the faithfulness of God? And yet their memories of God's revelation of himself were very short. And we find them here in Exodus 16 grumbling, saying we're thirsty and we're hungry and we're stuck out here in the wilderness. We just wish God had left us slaves in Egypt where we were happy and full. And if he was going to bring us out here to the desert, he should have just killed us next to the meat pots. Doesn't that sound like an attractive lunch option? The meat pots of Egypt. Seriously, how could these people doubt the goodness of God? How could they complain and protest that God was anything other than faithful. And yet they did. I believe that the fact that God did not destroy them right then and there for their ungratefulness and for their forgetfulness is perhaps the greatest sign of his mercy and grace that we hope to see. For indeed, instead of destroying them, God gave them yet another chance to depend on him. In his grace, God provided for them in a fresh way. Out of love, he rained down bread from heaven every morning, and he covered the ground with quail every night. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness, we asked in our psalm? Well, yes, he can. And yes, he did. For again, while we are quick to forget the power of God, God is all the quicker to forgive us for the times that our faith in him fades. And here in Exodus, we find him faithfully feeding his unfaithful people over and over again with what the psalmist calls the bread of angels. But human unfaithfulness is a stubborn thing. And it shouldn't surprise us, but it does, That even with bread on the ground every morning, those freed Hebrew slaves continued to hedge their bets. In verse 4 of our reading from Exodus, God tells Moses, I'm going to give my people bread from heaven every morning. But they should only gather one day's portion. And this is a test. Will they follow my law? Will they trust me? Or will they hoard the bread out of the fear that I might suddenly become unfaithful. Spoiler alert, they did not trust him. 
They did not stay faithful. They hoarded the bread, regularly collecting more than they needed each day. And that saved portion, that hedge against the risk that God has suddenly become unfaithful out of nowhere, that hedge would be full of what? Worms and stench the next morning when they went to eat it. As stubborn as human unfaithfulness, God's faithfulness in this story as well continues to be unfailing. For yet again, despite their complaining and their hoarding and their disobedience and their hedging of their bets about the faithfulness of God, he still fed them. This is remarkable that for the 40 years they wandered through the desert, this meal was provided to them each and every day. Now, it is easy for us to feel superior to the Hebrews. Surely we would have acted differently in this moment, but I don't know. Maybe I would have missed the meat pots of Egypt too. Would I have questioned that God could provide for me after seeing the Red Sea parted and I walk through on dry land? Would I have hoarded manna in violation of his direct command to me? I fear I would have. And so I must ask myself, do I trust that God will provide for me, give me the things that I need, or do I clutch and hoard and complain and doubt? No differently than did the former Hebrew slaves, we find it so easy to criticize. What about each one of you? Praise the Lord that he is long-suffering. Amen? He's patient, he's kind, in his grace, he's quick to forgive our faithlessness and to feed us over and over again, even when we do not deserve it. Think again with me about that imaginary visit of Jesus in the flesh with us this morning. How long before we'd file away the miracles that we witnessed on that day and moved right back in to our normal lives? Turn with me to our gospel lesson. Just before this passage in John, Jesus had provided food for 5,000 men and all of their families. And can you imagine how stunned and thrilled and enthralled they must have all been? They would have had a no less visceral experience of the power of God than you and I would have if Jesus came to visit Christ Church this morning to meet us and heal us and bless us before he went back to heaven. And yet we find them chasing Jesus down on the, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and they're asking deeply unfaithful questions. Jesus sees them coming, and he knows their hearts. They're coming to him not to thank him or to worship him, or to declare their fealty to him. No, they're just coming because they want to hoard more of the blessings of God. Jesus looks at them in verse 26 and he says, you know, you're not here because what I just did on the other side of the Sea of Galilee feeding you, you're not here because that converted you. You're just here because you like to have your bellies full. Don't long for the bread that fades away. Trust me for that. Rather long for the bread of life, the food that endures to eternal life. That is what I'm here to give to you. And in reply, the people ask Jesus a very odd question. And it's a question that reveals what's actually going on inside of their hearts. What must we do to do the works of God? Sounds like they're trying to figure out how to be faithful to God, but that's not what they're asking. They're saying, how can we have the kind of power that you have, Jesus? We want to be in charge of our own lives, our own futures. We want to tap in the kind of authority you have so that we can have what we want when we want it. And Jesus' reply cuts to the very heart of the human experience. You want to do the works of God? Well, the work of God is this, to not trust in yourself, 
but to trust in me. To not trust in human power, but in the power of Jesus, the one who has been sent to you. And the people, what's the next thing they say? They immediately, having been fed across the water, say, well, can you give us another sign? Can you give us another work of power? We've just forgot what you did. We need it again. And Jesus offers them the only thing that can satisfy, which is himself. He offers them himself, the bread of life, the only answer to the hunger and the thirst of a human heart. And the same is true for me. And the same thing is true for you. Only Jesus and not what he can do for you can satisfy your soul. Now, I don't want us to go home today discouraged by our unfaithfulness. It's just the old Adam in us. Uh, Rather, I want us to be encouraged by the faithfulness of God. So hear me. We stumble, and he picks us up. We grumble, and he continually, patiently provides for us. We prove ourselves fickle, and he proves himself unwavering in his love for you and for me. And so we'll let the last word be from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul urges us to strive for faithfulness, for holiness, to let God's faithfulness convert us so that we would walk in a manner worthy of God's calling, that we would be humble people, gentle people, patient people. What a call that is in this moment of human existence, to be patient and humble, and not prideful, but gentle. Finding our pride not in ourselves, but in the God that feeds us over and over again. And and hear me when I say this too, we have a huge advantage over those wandering Hebrews and those Galileans who have been fed on the green grass of the banks of the Sea of Galilee. Because, my friends, through baptism... We have the Holy Spirit living within us. Beginning in verse 13, Paul says that by the power of God living inside of us, we can have lasting faith in Jesus. We can attain knowledge of him. We can grow up maturely in our lives as his sons and his daughters. We can grow up into the full measure of the stature of Christ. And we can stop being children, tossed to and fro by every false doctrine and human foolishness. The Spirit in you and the Spirit in me can give us the power to grow up every way into Jesus. And that, my friends, is good news. Let me close with a word of hope. God is faithful. He has given you and me so many ways of experiencing his faithful on a faithfulness on a daily basis. His spirit lives inside of you. He lives inside of me. And I can read his word every day, and by the power of the spirit, he will reveal himself to me and to you. And if you don't know that, and if I don't know that, then we are not reading his word enough. It is the power to change human lives. We can pray to him morning, noon, and night. He's at the right hand interceding for us. And if you don't know the power of prayer, and I don't know the power of prayer, then we're not praying enough. God shows up every day powerfully in our lives. And today, he wants to feed us literally with the bread of heaven. Look with me at that wrought iron candle burning back there next to the window. Do you all know what that is? It's called a sanctuary lamp. And when it is lit, which it almost always is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's a reminder that the bread of heaven is in the room, that God is with us. It tells us that there is blessed bread waiting for us 
in the altar. There's a box inside the altar that we call the sanctuary. And in it, any of the bread that wasn't consumed the week before waits for you to come back. The broken body of Jesus, the bread of heaven, this is my body, he says, given for you. It's there to feed the people of God. That candle reminds us that God shows up and he feeds us. Reminds us the best thing that we can do in this life is to feed on the food of Jesus, to trust God, to not hoard our manna, to not seek to be in charge of our own lives, to let him take away our hunger and our thirst for self-rule and to just let him be the king. We can be quick to forget the power of God, but God is just as quick to forgive us for the times that our faith in him fades. And he faithfully feeds us over and over again so that his spirit might make us holy. And he does all of that for the sake of his glory. Amen? Amen. Please.